Hi, welcome to the Golden Years, Understanding Better Living. I'm Phyllis Amon, your host. Today we are so pleased to have with us Lynn Biat Gordon, who is the Chief Operations Officer and co-founder of the National Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners, founded in 2003, and also the International Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners, founded in 2015. Lynn, thanks so much for making a long trip to be here today. You came quite a distance. How long did it take you to get here? About two and a half hours. From wow, the that's really terrific. The viewers are, are really excited to hear what you have to say and the information you have to share. Okay. So I'm so thrilled to have you here today. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my pleasure. I I'm a certified dementia practitioner. I became one just a few months ago, actually. And so I learned so much when I took the course, even though I've been a professional who's worked with people mm -hmm. who have cognitive issues over the years. Um, but I learned so much, I thought it was important for our viewers to hear, you know, from the actual organization, mm -hmm. information that would be helpful and help them understand their loved ones or, you know, people that they know. Wonderful. So, you know, about dementia, there are many different kinds of dementia. You know, the first episode uh, we did, I had the um, Connecticut chapter of Alzheimer's, and we talked okay. about the difference between, you know, that Alzheimer's is a d disease and dementia is more of a symptom, and there are, right. you know, many conditions that contribute to dementia. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, a lot of people interchangeably use the words Alzheimer's and dementia Correct. without realizing there's over 100 different illnesses and diseases that cause dementia. And Alzheimer's is just one of those. Alzheimer's, of course, accounts for two-thirds of all cases of dementia. Um, so it's easy for people to use that term in a common way, where it might not be Alzheimer's that their loved one might be suffering from. So, so what would be the difference then between Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, I'm sure that dementia depends on the illness that causes dementia, right. but right. what would be some of the main differences that people would see or think about? Okay. Well, with presentations, for the most part, your patient is probably going to look very similar regardless of which disease or illness they have. In some cases, there are big variations, but for the most part, even the treatment approaches are very similar. Um, but for example, someone could suffer from a alcohol-related dementia, alcohol-induced related dementia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, someone could suffer from a um, vascular disease, which might cause dementia. Um, so, but for the most part, you'll see the same pres similar presentations in the patient, but I think it's more important to know exactly what disease or illness is causing the dementia so that we'll know which treatments to go through in terms of medications. Oh, Behaviorally, okay. we're going to react and interact with the patient the same way across the board pretty much. But what really is important is to understand which medications are going to suit this person based on what their, what I would call their comorbidities are, you know, what their other diagnoses are and what other medications they're taking as well. So in terms of dementia and Alzheimer's, because Alzheimer's obviously is is a very regressive uh, disease that, yes. that affects cognition. Yes. So, you know, I, I say to people, it's, you know, you, you're regressing almost to where you started from. That's basically the process of what happened. To a certain degree, yes. To, yes. to a certain yes. degree. Yes. So is that similar with other kinds of dementia? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So you'll see some of the same type of progression. Some illnesses will cause a more rapid progression, where some you'll see a moderate slow change over time just like with Alzheimer's so it just it depends you know and and truly everyone responds differently depending on who they are well just like, like anything it, right. right and right. so what you'll see is one person who um, you know might have a very uh, rapid decline say in a year's time someone else might decline over a two or three year time, right. you know, and they might have the same exact diagnosis. Yeah, there's so no predictability. It's very right. difficult to predict. And so what I always say is just like anything else, everybody has their own time clock, right. you know, right. and we're all unique. And chemically, we're all different, just like some right. of us are diabetic and some of us are not. Right, right. You know, so it's, it's very similar that way where you'll see the disease progress or act out in a different way sometimes. You know, it's interesting mm -hmm. that you say that about individual because when I've worked, you know, the viewers probably know by now I'm a speech pathologist right, and right. I've worked in many uh, skilled nursing facilities mm -hmm. and, you know, I've worked with people with a variety of different issues, um, 
you know, and I, my specialty was working with people who were vent dependent originally and yeah. trachs yeah. And, and stroke patients. And people mm -hmm. will say, well, how long do you think it's going to be? And I'd say, you know, I don't think anybody could tell you that. And mm -hmm. the example I always give is, and I, and I guess it applies to dementia as well, based on what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, I could get a cold and be fine in two days, three days, right. and two weeks later you could still be coughing. So, you know, it does depend on exactly. the person's individual makeup. And we always say that, even in our course that we present, we say, you know, when you've met one person with Alzheimer's, you met one. They're all right. going to be unique. Right, all and I unique. think that's an, a very yeah. important thing because people have this preconceived notion, um, and once you have that diagnosis, you know, I think people already are seeing the, the end. Um, yes. You know, they, like their, their mind goes there immediately right, right. Um, rather than dealing with what's in front of them at that moment, that day, that week, that month, that year. Right, right. And we always say you have so much living to do. Regardless right. of a diagnosis, you have so much living to right. do. Right. And so, some, you know, we would hope that practitioners, family members, whoever, would not just write someone off because of their diagnosis. Right. But understand they still have a lot more living to do. And it's our focus to try to promote the best quality of life for whatever time frame they have left. Right. And so that's really how the NCCBP was born. Oh. Um, you know, years ago, my business partner and I, we both started the company together, Sandra Stimson. Um, when we started the business, it came out of a need where people were saying, you know, our frontline staff, even our caregivers, you know, if it's a husband or wife at home struggling to take care of their loved one, they need information because is this really the end? Right. What do we do now? You know, right. should we be writing wills and, right. you know, all these things? And so we would do consulting at facilities, nursing homes and assisted livings, and we would be presenting topics at a time, I would say. Right. So someone would say, could you come in and talk about just an overview of what the chemistry of the brain is like, what's going on with dementia or right. al Alzheimer's specifically. Um, and then they would say, well, can you develop a topic and can you come in and talk to us about wandering? What do we do when our loved one wanders? Right. Why does that happen? Could you come and talk to us about aggression? What is that about? Does she right. hate me now? Right, right, you know, right. And we're saying, no, you have to understand it has to do with what's going on in the brain, right. not necessarily what's going on out here. Sometimes it is related right. to what's going on out right, here. Right, right. Um, so over time, we started developing these different modules in order to help the caregiver understand you have a whole lot of living to do. And if we can do the research and bring the information to you to help you along the way, then we've done our job. And so we started writing, you know, and researching and developing this curriculum over time. And we said we can condense this and get it down to an eight-hour course. Right. And it is, an eight, it is a full eight-hour <laughs> course. If anybody is interested, I have yep. to tell you, it is a full eight-hour course. To the minute, right? To the minute. It <laughs> yes. is to the minute. Yes. No there's joke. There's so much information. But there's so much information. Yeah. So much I learned. And yeah. like I said, I've worked with many people right. with right. different kinds of dementia. Yeah. But I learned so much in that course. Yeah. And thank you. And, you know, so once we did that, we thought, okay, we're going to go to facilities and we're going to tar start doing presentations and we're going to invite caregivers also, not just the frontline staff, right. but the caregivers at home need the same information. And we started doing that. And one day we walked out of a nursing home and a nurse's aide came up to us and said, so am I certified now? And we looked at her and that was that light bulb moment right. where we said, oh my goodness, you know, this is what's lacking across the country. Standardized quality dementia education. Correct. And training. And right. training. Right. And so we realized, and certification, you know, right. showing that people have made the extra effort as well as the commitment to continue their dementia education so that they can be the best possible caregiver out there on that right. unit or whether it's in that home. Correct. You know, so that's how we started the company and the certification added to it. Um, so in doing so, we never thought, you know, going back 16 years, we never thought that it would grow the way that it has. But here we are with the cases of dementia growing oh, exponentially worldwide. Absolutely. We know just here in the United States that Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death. death. Correct. And we do know, I always said, you know, people use that magic number 65. Where do you get that from? You know, oh, 65 is the age of retirement. Right. Oh, 65 is when you're 
elderly. Okay. But guess what? 65 also is what they say, that every 65 seconds someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Co correct. And, and I you think uh, there is a statistic that says by 2050, the, in the United States alone, mm -hmm. they anticipate without a cure or, or any kind of other kind of treatment right. that 15 million people that's will have Alzheimer's. And that's only in the United, in the US United States. Now, that's worldwide, I uh, read an interesting statistic that someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Originally, I thought it was every six seconds. And a few weeks ago, I thought I read that it was every three seconds. I was on a website where I saw that. But it's, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a tremendously important issue that people need to understand. And, you know, there are many different ways that it's being approached. Um, now they, you know, communities are becoming dementia-friendly communities. Absolutely. I'd like to talk about that so yeah. people have an understanding about yes. that. It's very exciting, actually. It is. It is. You know, we've been trying to, I think, across the country for a number of years, and it's been slow, um, de uh, creating dementia-friendly communities. Now what you might see is um, even restaurants might have a sign, you know, to let you know oh, that I they haven't are seen dementia that, friendly. Yeah, so now restaurants, hotels, we have um, a collaboration, or not, I'll say an affiliation with the TSA for the United oh. States government, um, because we have input on their monthly meetings to say you've got to make the TSA, the airport process, mm. dementia friendly. People right. don't understand. I don't take off my shoes. I do keep them on. They're right. seeing someone else accuse them, so they want to right. take theirs off, not realizing that they right. don't have to. You know, so we're even, um, you know, spreading information in all avenues to make dementia-friendly communities. Now, specifically, there's been communities developed where, you know, everything is ADA equipped. So right. someone's house, the doors are wide enough for a wheelchair right. or even a stretcher. The showers can accommodate a shower chair. Right. You know, the handles are ADA. Um, equipped so that anyone, even with a prosthesis, could be able to open Tell the door. Tell people what ADA is. I should say that. The American Disabilities right, Act. Right. So what we want to say is we're, we try to make sure that the facilities, like most anything in, in healthcare, um, will be ADA compliant. Right. right. Yeah. We had a gentleman on so. here a couple of weeks ago who's an architect who actually is certified to um, design, build, and modify private homes. Okay. Um, for those who need those kind of accommodations, whether mm -hmm. they're disabled or they're older and need accommodations for that reason. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's very important. When you said about the airport, though, mm -hmm. what about when a person gets on the airplane? And what about uh, behaviors that can erupt, I'll say, you know, as a result of being of on the, the airplane? airplane? Right. So that's one of our thrusts, that even your airline personnel need to be trained right. in what's the proper communication technique to use if someone seems to be panicking, if they're repeating themselves, asking the same questions over and over, trying to get up when they're supposed to stay seated, right. you know, um, different things like that. So they need their education as well. And we, you know, it's kind of funny because everyone thought, you know, oh, everyone in healthcare needs to be to be educated. Right. No, everybody needs, needs to, be. to be educated because we're all affected by dementia. I, I agree. Us. And yes. actually, um, you know, you mentioned communication. We were talking about mm -hmm. this before mm -hmm. we, we got on air. You know, as a speech pathologist, obviously yes. that's something that's near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. And when I went through the training, I was like, oh my God, I could talk about this yes. because yes. people, and it's not just for dementia, but particularly for people that have dementia, mm -hmm. you know, how you communicate is so very so important. important. And to be able to read what the person is saying to you behind the words or beyond the words, yeah. reading their facial expression, yeah. their tone of voice, their body language, because the, they may not have the right words, but they may be conveying some other level of frustration or right. just because, um, you know, I, I've talked about this uh, when I do my own seminars, um, that, you know, somebody could be saying, you know, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home. They could be home that it could be that what they're really saying is they need comforting, they need Absolutely. that, you know, the comfort that they're used to getting when they were home, whether That's it's right. you're from their family, loved ones, even from when they were younger, yeah. uh, it's bringing them back to that time. So it's way beyond the words themselves. Absolutely, because sometimes with dementia, we might only have one word left. Correct. And that word means everything. Correct. And so that's part of our um, training in that 
uh, when we talk about communication, we say, what if this person only has one word? Right. That means that now we have to be the detective as the caregiver. Correct. We have to pay attention to the nuances. Is she saying it in a relaxed way? Is she saying it in a tense way? Does right. she say it with some kind of, um, you know, is, it there, is there an anxious Anx tone, an anxiety, a sad right. tone? And so we have to be good detectives because it's not just the words anymore because sometimes those are gone. So, so uh, what I say to people is, and not comparing an adult who has, whose cognition has declined to a point where they, mm -hmm. you know, they've regressed to that point yeah. where they only have one word. I say like you regress to where you started in a way. Mm -hmm. So I, what I, I tell people is, think of if you had a baby right. and they were crying or um, they only had one word. Um, what would you, how would you approach them? You would think, are they wet? Are they hungry? Are they cold? Are they, are they tired? What are they trying to convey with those cries? Why, we have to apply that same level of thinking to the person exactly. who has dementia. Exactly. So one of the things that we talk about in our classroom is to use basic needs first, to go to the basic needs right. first. So if you're not understanding them and they realize you don't understand them, right. let's go to basic needs. Right. Is it that they're fatigued? Is it that they're cold? Is it that they're thirsty? Right. Um, is it that they just need comfort? Right. You know, do they need yeah. that hug, hug that right. occasional hug that they need throughout, you know, right. periodically throughout the day? Um, and so it's important for us to go to basic needs first. And if that's not it, then sometimes we have to be creative right. and try to figure out what could it be. Right. You know, and sometimes offering something by saying the word does not help because they might not understand the word anymore. Right. So sometimes we have to use gestures. Right. And it's a case-by-case -case basis because, as we said, everybody's different. Right. Everybody's different. So it might be, you know, actually gesturing, are you thirsty? Right. You know, right. are you tired? Right. You know, um, but every, and the more that you work with your client, the more you get to know them. And you get to kind of find out what kinds of gestures, what kind of nonverbal language works with them, you know, that they can actually still interpret. You know, I... Um, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, a very good friend. Uh, actually, it was last week, and she was um, she was telling me a story. She went on vacation with her daughter and her two grandchildren, um, who she takes care of during the week. And um, they were in an, obviously they were in an unfamiliar place. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. the younger one, who I think is five, uh, woke up in this room. She didn't know where she was. Yeah. It was dark, and she got hysterical. She started crying, and she was frantic. And so from that conversation, I said to her, you know, I'm going to remind people of what it feels like to be in that situation. Okay. Think about the person who's confused. Mm -hmm. um, maybe now they're not home anymore with their loved ones, or maybe they're not in their own home. Maybe they are in a skilled nursing right. facility. Right and they wake up in a room and they have no idea where they are and people only hear people crying out and they don't understand what that's about. That's right. That's right. So it's so important to realize that you know from moment to moment we could be comfortable and then right. six minutes later we don't recognize this location. It's not our home. It's not our daughter. This doesn't look like my dining room. And so right. how do we approach that? We can't panic. Right. We have to be the calm because that's what they're looking for. They're right. looking for calm. They're looking for comfort, and they're looking for someone to help us reason the way. Right. You know, so we have to be very. It means being very patient, meaning sometimes right. repeating ourselves. And I always say, I don't care if you have to say it 20 times a day. Right. Every time you say it, you're going to say it as though it's the first time. Right. Because you have to help this person be oriented. It's important, as I said before, we're trying to add quality to their life for whatever term right. of life they have left. But also, we're trying to interject moments of joy. Right. Create moments of joy whenever we can. Because if you think about, for those of us who have been around the dementia population a lot, if you think about the clients that you know who suffer with the symptoms, and you think about the, the, an eight-hour day with them, and you look at the expressions that they present to you throughout the day, the majority of those expressions are fear, Sadness, absolutely. Loneliness, absolutely. You know, and so it's important for us to interject moments of joy. And how do we do that? By helping them reason the way. Right. You know? Right. Right. And 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 as we we're saying with communication, in a tone that is welcoming, right. 
and we have to be very cognizant and so, and so of our body language, right. our tone of voice. You know, we have to make sure we're conveying the right messages because what if they don't understand all of our words? Right. You know, and so I always say there's a melody behind your speech. Right. Absolutely. And so I can tell if I'm in a good mood based on right. how I sound, and right. I can tell when I'm not. Well, you but know, and so doesn't I ever say that's so important. Right. Doesn't don't Thank people you. that you work with know that, or your family, or somebody you get on the phone? I can't tell you how many times mm -hmm. I've gotten on the phone. Right. A friend has called and said, "Oh, you're you're not." you're not feeling well today or what's wrong I say yeah, yeah. oh no maybe I was just distracted or it didn't come across sure. the way mm -hmm. I normally come across right. and people detect that how many times people are having a conversation with someone and and you know they respond in a certain way and then they think the person was conveying something but that's not what they meant they say I didn't mean that well that's how it sounded right. so right. now to the person who's confused that's even more so yeah so now you add cognitive impairment correct to that. now what they're trying to do if they don't understand our words they're trying to read our signals and our right. sounds. Right, right, so right. So our intonation is important. Right. That we speak in a, you know, in a calm tone of voice. You know, it's important with our body language to use welcoming body language, right. not closed. Body right, language. right. You know, so that right. understand. Right. Yeah, right. exactly, exactly. So, and I think what happens though with caregivers, is they are in it all day long, and right. sometimes it's frustrating. Absolutely. And it's, sometimes it's wearing at their patience. Correct. And so it's easy sometimes to, be, you know, become short and abrupt. Right. And we have to remind people that's human. That's human behavior. Right. And forgive you know, yourself human for, that, for that moment. Yes. Right. That, and I always and say just take go. a moment, right. regroup, exactly. and come back and think about if all this person could understand is your body language and your sound, what would you do now? Right. You know, right. and one day, God forbid, what if you're that person? Correct. How would you want them to? How would you want the caregiver to relate to you? You know, it's so interesting that you say that because in all the talks that I give mm -hmm. and in my book and you know people who know me, you know I I've been saying for years, you know, you it's this is not an us and them thing. It's not like those people over there, those older people, those people with dementia, those people with that disease, with cancer, eight, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's not them and us. It's us because. Mm -hmm we are all going to that's our future selves I mean you know you may not have cancer you may not have a stroke you may not have dementia but mm -hmm. you are going to become older mm -hmm. and whatever comes along with that that's what you're going to present with right. so this is not an us and them thing it's not a thing about over there you're talk, thinking about yourself as much as you are that person that you're dealing with that's at right. the moment Absolutely. But and something else we talked about that we really connected on is cultural diversity. Oh yeah. Now the cultural diversity mm -hmm. is such an important issue because many of the caregivers, um, you know, not only in skilled nursing facilities but mm -hmm. home care agencies, many of them come from other countries. Yeah. You know, there are different um, different attitudes towards communication different expectations some cultures you're not supposed to look at an older person you know there are different boundaries in terms of physical distance when you talk to somebody touch so does you know NCCDP uh, address that we do um, so when we are presenting our module on diversity we talk about the fact that yes we're all different we all come from our different countries of origin, ethnic backgrounds, religions, and all that. But when we come within the confines of our facility, we become, as you said, we become one. Right. And so that's where education becomes very important inside the building to say, we know at home we would do it this way, or we would look someone directly in the eye this way. But in the facility here under this culture, the auspices right. of this culture, this is how we're going to handle this. Right. You know, so it's important for people to understand that, yes, we're not asking anyone to deny their culture. We're not asking right. anyone to, you know, deny their religion um, or honor something that they're not permitted to honor. Right. But what we're saying is, in terms of communication, we have to be on the same page in the building, especially in memory care. Right. Especially so how much care. training is, or how much is NCCDP involved in you know, training in skilled nursing facilities, or in, and it's not only in skilled nursing facilities because assisted livings now, yeah. some of them have memory care units. Oh, yeah. And I know that the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services now requires more training, Absolutely. especially if you're working, if you have a unit and you're working on that unit. Um, 
So how is NCCDP involved in that? Because there are over 15,000 nursing homes in yes. this country. Yes. And the reality is, while some of them may have a unit or an area mm -hmm. dedicated to people who have cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. not all of them do. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. so how is NCCDP involved wow. with that? We're excited because we're making a, bar a very large impact nationwide. Um, right now we have over 200,000 members. That means over 200,000 people who have been educated with our curriculum that are certified dementia practitioners. We have over 2,000 trainers that are certified to teach our curriculum nationwide. So that we're momentum has been. We're going to have 2001 when we finish. That's right. Talked, that's right. <laughs> we talked about that. I'm not kidding, that's right? right. That's right. No, you're right. not kidding. Before the end of that's July, right. I just, we're I we're already decided this has to, I have Absolutely. to get this done. So, yeah, that's So it's exciting. 2001 officially, right? Uh, officially, <laughs> yes. And, and, and so with that, we have trainers um, providing training in just about every type of agency you can think of. From your nursing homes, your assisted livings, your retirement communities, your home health care agencies. We even have the course being taught at um, geriatric departments in universities around oh, the country. Oh, cool. That's great. Yeah. So we're, I mean, we, we are as widespread as University of Alaska, you know. So we're in University of Montana. We're in University of Arkansas. Can we're I all interrupt over the place. and ask you a question? Because you mm -hmm. said in mm -hmm. um, gerontology programs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What about for physicians? What about in... Uh, actual medical school uh, curriculum. They are not quite ready for us Ooh. yet. We have brought that up, and we Ooh. do have physicians. I must say, we do have physicians that do come to our course. Oh, they and do. I think that's wonderful. It's wonderful. But shouldn't it be a requirement now, especially in medical school? Why absolutely. isn't it? No, I'm on that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm an and advocate I, for that. And I know, you know, there are, well, you know, years ago, remember, the only doctor that we had was the GP, the general Correct. practitioner. So as we saw the needs growing in our community, we started creating these various disciplines. Right. You know, so now we do have geriatricians when years ago there was no such word. Correct. So that's a good thing. So we do know that we do have um, the, you know, gerontology, gerontological medicine being taught now right. in the med schools, which is wonderful. However, you, you have a whole other group of physicians who might not see that it affects them or that it's necessary for them to know more because it might not touch the population that they directly treat. Hmm. However, that could change. But not only that, yeah. I mean, you could you could be um, have a specialty in internal medicine, and you sure. could have a private practice. Mm -hmm. But you know, um, some of your patients are going to get older, right. and some of them may present with that. Do you yeah. know when they present with that? Do you test for that? Do you know how to right. do that? What's your education about that? Right. Is there continuing education about that uh, from the American Medical Association? I mean, this is something I'm just thinking about mm -hmm. as we're talking, mm -hmm. um, and you know, so many doctors work in nursing homes. Absolutely. So you, you are going to come across somebody um, sooner or later with some kind of diagnosis of dementia uh, at one level or, or right. another right. or Alzheimer's. So are you trained in that? I mean, I don't know if doctors who go into nursing homes have to be trained in that? I don't I don't know if that's part of the requirement when they're credentialed. Probably not. Not. No. Uh, right. No. So that's that's so, another yeah. area where NCCDP could be very, very valuable Absolutely. in terms of education. Absolutely. Because the more people, as you say, the more people that know the better. Right. We even, you know, when you think about the, you know the the different professions, we even have a specialized training just for first responders. Oh, that's terrific. Because, you know, you have a first responder who literally is the first person on the scene. Correct. What do you do when you meet this person? They're cognitively impaired. They're trying to tell you where they live, but they can't get the words out. Right. You know, so now we have a first responder training so that they have learned now good communication techniques, learning to also what's very important is understanding more about aggression and dementia. Right. So that they don't treat the person as though they're going they're, to have to arrest them. Right. You know, or they, because or that it has happened, them. unfortunately. Right. You right. know, the person has been mishandled because they didn't realize right. they were cognitively impaired and didn't know, you know, how to interact with Just them. Just like um, psychological, you know, emotional impairments. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. you know, I, mm -hmm. I think we've come a little further right. um, in that regard, mm -hmm. but it kind of falls into the same right. category. You know, a couple of years ago, I had a... Um, a uh, patient in a nursing home facility. Mm -hmm. uh, he was there on a short-term rehabilitation unit. He was um, he was younger than I was, and he had a stroke. And um, unfortunately, because of the type of stroke he had, 
you know, he couldn't really, what was coming out of his mouth, we would call it word salad. I mean, yeah. you really couldn't make yeah. head or tails of it. Mm -hmm. And his, his comprehension, his understanding of language wasn't so great either. But physically, he was fine. He looked great. And he wanted to go home very, very, very badly. I mean, you know, I worked with him every day for months. Mm -hmm. He did get, mm -hmm. you know, a little better, I must say. But we were very concerned when he had to leave the facility yeah. for the very same reason that you're talking about. So it's not only dementia. I was saying if he walks in the street and something happens and a police officer or somebody comes up to him, right. he's not going to know what they say. Right. He may respond in a way mm -hmm. that's provoking or that somebody thinks it is, is retaliatory or right. aggressive and, right. and what can happen. So I certainly... You know, obviously that it applies even more so to somebody who's confused, who Absolutely. doesn't know where they are, yeah. and then, then what? I and mean, then, you yeah. know, how do you, how would any of us respond when we're confused, right? I was exactly. ta talking about my friend's granddaughter. I mean, she woke up in a room, she was screaming and frantic. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah, so, so it's important that these first responders have their education right. as well, whether they are policemen, firemen, EMT, uh, Red Cross, uh -huh. um, Salvation Army. I mean, oh, you think about people who are out there right. on, the, on the front lines when there is a fire, a flood, you know, an earthquake. They need this information. What about restaurants? Restaurants. That's what we were talking about. Where now restaurants are making a, are you joining the movement to be more dementia friendly? So that means that the waiters are taught to speak directly, slowly, take mm -hmm. their time. Some, some uh, restaurants have gone to having an alternate menu that has pictures because they might oh, not be able to terrific. discern the words now, right. but they can identify the meal by a right. photo. So there's lots of different things going on now in the facilities. Also making sure that, um, it, you know, that the companion who's with them is aware when they come in that, or that the companion knows to let the, the restaurant that know yes, that this that this I have a special guest. With right, right, that's right. fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think Connecticut is uh, becoming a dementia-friendly state. Is it not? I think so. I've read about it. Yeah, yeah I think there's a movement here for sure. Right, and yeah. um, I forgot how many states there are around the country. Do you? I mean? don't know the exact number, but it, how should I say this? It's. I think we're only up to maybe half. I was or less okay. than half. I, I, I don't the last think the number I remembered was like 11 or 13, yeah, but I could I be wrong. Yeah, I don't think I, it's more than 25. Right, which yeah. is a shame it because is. it's yeah. such an important issue. Yeah. And like you mm -hmm. say, it, you know, people are talking about it. But, Absolutely. you know, one of my goals is, you know, I said before we started, and people who know me, I say, you know, I'd like for a national conversation about this to really mm -hmm. happen because, Yes, you know, there's NCCDP, there's the Alzheimer's organization, there are other, you know, uh, advocacy groups, and, um, you know, there are commercials on television about, you know, medications and Alzheimer's and, you know, caring your home. But it's not really a conversation on a national level. Not really. And, and that's part of why I'm doing all of this, because yeah. I really want to get it there. Yeah. And, and it's not only about dementia and Alzheimer, but how are we, what are our attitudes towards getting older? What are our attitudes towards these people? You know, I was, I, um, was talking yesterday, and I was saying, um, you know, when, when a baby is born, you don't say they start here and they're declining. They start here and they're progressing. Right. So... Instead of thinking about it in terms of declining years, they're advancing years. You're continuing life's journey. You're mm -hmm. advancing. And whatever comes along at that point comes along. Right. And I, I just would hope that we could get to thinking about people who are advancing in age differently rather than declining years. Yeah. Maybe their cognition is declining. Yeah. Maybe yeah. physically they're declining because they're not what they were before, but they're really advancing in years, and this is part of that journey. This is part of the journey, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about in my presentations is that it doesn't matter what illness you're suffering from. Um, in most cases, I'll say, the spirit is not diseased. The spirit Correct. is there, and it's healthy, and it's vibrant. And we've seen, I know, you know, when people work in the field of dementia care, for a long time, they start to see evidence of that when you see clients who everyone thinks has really declined, doesn't know what's going on. Uh, right, right. And 
maybe she was a pianist and now you sit her in front of the piano maybe she's not even right. able to feed herself anymore and when you sit her in front of that piano she plays beethoven's yeah. fifth like like she she's been doing it for her whole years consistently right, right. yeah and i always say that you have to think about expressions that we use that express the spirit right like the arts the arts right. are a pure way to express absolutely the spirit. and then we have you know organized religion too right and sometimes you'll see someone just come out of their shell and show their spirit to us correct and show us how vibrant right. how much life there really still is in there but what happens to us out here as the caregivers we lose sight of that because right. we're looking at, well, what time does she have to be fed? Right. I have to change the bed. Right. What time is the caregiver right. coming to let me, you know, go home? Right. You know, sometimes we're caught up in that, and we're not in the time. task. The and task. Not, and not thinking about the person. Exactly. You know, I was hoping um, maybe one one uh, show will be able to have um, Dan Cohn here from Alive Inside. <gasps> oh, um, yeah. I've met him a few times, yeah. um, and I, I actually went to New York and had a chance to meet with him. I mean, it's it's such a great thing. I have the chills talking about Me it. Me too. When you and, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is I told him I study music, classical music, for many, many years. Mm -hmm. That was my first dream, to be a concert pianist. Oh. And so uh, for many years, working with people who were ventilator dependent and many had strokes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some were, you know, unfortunately not so responsive, right. um, I always would tell families to, you know, of course, those days it was a radio or a tape recorder. Okay, I'm dating myself, mm -hmm. but whatever. It was music. <laughs> yes, it was music. I'd say, you know, put their favorite music mm -hmm. on, not constantly, mm -hmm. but play their favorite music. Or if they were a big sports fan, you know, play, you know, a game Absolutely. that they enjoyed, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's a baseball game or a basketball game, you know, play right. that periodically. Um, so when I found out about his program, I was like intuitively, like I kind of always had that sense that m because music is so important to me and has been in my life, mm -hmm. it's part of who I am, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. part of my soul actually, I recognize that that would be the same for other people, yeah. right? Yeah, it's a, it's a very important tool for expression. Right. You know, and, and like I said, sometimes, you know, when someone is getting a little burnt out as a caregiver, all they see is, like you said, the tasks. Right. And when you play music, you start to get centered. Right, absolutely. And you start to appreciate the work that you do for that person. You right. start to appreciate even the nuances they show you, whether it's tapping one finger or blinking. Right. You, know? you know, I'm sure, yeah. you know, you've worked in um, many nursing homes, mm -hmm, and um, mm -hmm. I have too. And when they have, let's say, a concert or yeah. somebody comes yeah. and plays music and they'll Wonderful. say, oh, look at so-and-so, they're dancing in the chair or they're tapping their I mean, they do really come alive. Absolutely. And um, I mean, it really, I, you know, I use the example for people like if I g gave somebody the name of a song mm -hmm. and um, they'd say, gee, how does that song go? I, I really don't remember all of the words. Mm -hmm. But if the music starts, all of a sudden you find yourself being able to sing all of the lyrics to the end because it triggers a different part of the brain. It's automatic. Mm -hmm. It's very deep inside. Mm -hmm. And that's where that comes from. And Absolutely. that's why music is such a powerful tool. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, he does, he does amazing yeah. work. Yeah. Does NCCDP uh, partner with him or? No, or we haven't. We haven't partnered, but Dan, if you're listening, right. hey, there's always a partnership right. available. Right. Yeah. I, I think I, I think it's just great. You know, yeah. I've you know spoken to many facilities about getting the program. Mm -hmm. I know a few who have that. Who have, have it. the program? Yeah. yeah. And it, and they talk. It's you great. Know, they say wonderful things about it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, then uh, you and I talked about um, dementia practitioners. Mm -hmm. There are trainers, mm -hmm. and then there are managers. Yes. So can you talk yes. a little bit about that? Because sure. I'm interested in that actually. Okay. Yeah, so we have um, certified dementia care practitioners, um, which those are the folks who are certified or licensed in their healthcare care field. So your frontline staff who have sat through our eight-hour curriculum and have been licensed and certified in their field and have been in the field three years or more working specifically in dementia care. Okay. So when they take our class, they're eligible to get certified as dementia practitioners. Then you have our trainer program. Uh, we call them the Certified Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia Care Trainers. So they become certified to become trainers to teach our curriculum to their frontline staff. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. Now, any, I shouldn't confuse anyone, but 
Um, anyone can take our class, but not everybody's eligible to get certified as a oh, nurse practitioner. Oh, why? So why? as I was saying. That's interesting. So say a husband taking care of his wife, he comes to the facility, you know, seven days a week. He wants to take the class to get the dementia education. That's what we want. But he might not be eligible to get certified after he oh. completes the course because he's not licensed or certified in a healthcare field, and he's probably okay. not been working directly in dementia care for three years. Right. So okay. that's the distinction. Right. So anyone can take the class. We encourage everyone to take the dementia and course. And I think it's valuable in people. Definitely, people should. It's very. Yeah. It's absolutely helpful. Um, so, uh, so you have the course, and people can get certified or maybe not be eligible, and then you have the trainer portion where someone can get certified to become a trainer. So we do a 12 hour day with people who will I know sit through. I happen to know it's 12 hours. Yes. I didn't do the other four. <laughs> that day I couldn't do the other four. I was like, right. 12 hours? It's a really? 12 hour day with us. <laughs> but you're sitting through the class and what we're actually doing is we're actually demonstrating a live class for you. Okay. So the whole point is the trainer comes in early while we set up and tell them all kinds of specifics about uh, running the, the course. Right. And then the class starts we do the full eight-hour day so that the trainer is observing the class so they can see what kinds of questions come up. Oh, okay. They are previewing our, our PowerPoint slides for the first time. They're seeing what the student handout notebook looks like because that's a pretty lengthy notebook that every student yes, gets I, when they come yeah, to the class. Right. Um, so they're hearing all the, you know, get, taking in all the information. And when the class ends and all the students leave, we keep the trainer for another two and a half hours. Okay. And so they're with us going over more trainer specifics. We talk to them about um, how to market their course, what to do when they're teaching inside their facility versus if they're hired by an organization or to teach at a conference versus if they're hired uh, by another facility to teach oh, okay. staff. You know, so there's so many different ways that our, um, our trainers can present the program. Um, so we have them full day and they get supplemental materials from us. Not only do they get the instructor manual and the master student handout notebook, but they also get the PowerPoint on a flash drive. They also get um, supplemental books, one on architectural design, another oh, one that's on terrific. another supplemental book on Alzheimer's disease and dementia care. And we ask them to please read through these because it's it's supplemental information for you to have because we couldn't right. possibly put it all on the slide. Right. So this is you know uh, more information for them to have. And also what we have is a um, video that we give them on intimacy and aging, uh, which is very important. Very important yeah. topic. And we just launched a brand new video that it, we just um, created from NCCDP um, that covers intimacy and aging. And we talk about the topics that a lot of people don't talk about. Right, because like, it's an uncomfortable subject right, for people. Like, what types of things should we be talking to our practitioner about if we're an elderly person? A sex life is a, is a very important part of our lives. Absolutely. You know, but when we get older, we have a societal. Correct. Uh, we talked about that on the right. phone, actually, right? We have right? societal norms right. that try to hush this. Right. And, and it's not considered like an aberration. Right. Or if you're older, and you're not supposed to have those feelings exactly. or involvement. And you know what we say at NCCDP? Your libido dies when you die. Right. It's, exactly. it's very, <laughs> right. It's and absolutely. So our, so our video covers that. And we talk about all kinds of things from... Um, the issues that they might confront because of illness, like someone right. with arthritis. So if they're suffering with pain, then their intimate relations might be difficult because of pain. So maybe right. they need to talk to their doctor about having an analgesic prior right. so that they can right. make the experience more comfortable. Right. We talk about people who might suffer with respiratory illness so that that right. means that they won't be lying down. Yeah, they right. might be having to sit up. Right. You know, so we're talking about things that s most people Or the breathing issues that would come with, you with know, right. as the intimacy intimate moments advancing. Exactly. Right. So we address that, uh, which a lot of, you know, um, to this point that I've seen sexual intimacy and sexuality education um, in terms of the elderly population, not seeing no. people having frank discussions about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And so working, not to interrupt, but working in nursing homes, I could tell you it's a very uncomfortable topic. People don't want to address it. And I myself, it took me years to come to it. I, I have to be honest with yeah. you. It did. You think, oh, that's like an aberration or what's wrong with exactly. them or whatever. But right. as I've gotten older, I realize that, yeah. you know, it's it's an important part of life. It, right. it is. I, I once read a quote. It said something about um, in, in the United States that we think that um, intimacy is for the young and restless, but not for those on Golden Pond. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And I thought, well, this is, I like that. But it's true. That, but it's and, true. 
And so in our, um, what we do know nationwide is that the topic of sexual expression in the elderly is very rarely taught in our facilities. That's but right. something of sexual nature happens every day in our facilities. Absolutely. So why aren't we educating our Correct. staff? Correct. So that's why we feel this video is very important. So if someone's not comfortable, if they're the in-house educator and they're not comfortable with this topic, get our video. Right. Turn it on. It right. comes with a companion workbook also. Right. You know, right. so, it, it, and w also a big part of this um, video is we talk about what happens with sexual expression as a result of dementia and how do we handle ah, it. Ah, that you know, is very interesting. What do we do right. when there's, um, you know, a delusion right. and that we're paranoid about something? What do we do when um, it appears that one person is in the know and the other person is not? Uh -huh. So we address a lot of different issues. And also a big part of this for us is addressing LGBT issues too. Okay. Because that would be very the important. country is, you know, catching up now. Right. It's moving so in a different direction. So slow, yes, but, but catching up absolutely. now. And it's very important to talk about L LGBT issues and how it impacts care in our facilities. Right. And also, how do you find a facility for your loved one that is LGBT friendly? What are the signs? We, right. we spell it all out in the video. Right. Um, so we cover a lot of different topics in 23 minutes. Right. <laughs> And we felt that, you know, we tried to cover, we couldn't cover everything, but we covered the key points. Right. Because it is the topic that is very rarely presented in our facilities, unfortunately. Ab absolutely. Like I said, I have my own experience with it, you yeah. know, through the years. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, um, sure. you know, and I have seen, I have seen things change um, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. You know, when, when two people, older people, they form a, a bond, a friendship, or whatever, and then they want to have that experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, the facility facilities I have found, um, you know, I mean, it's it's a human nature. They they have to find a way to accommodate that. And then right. if people are in a room and there are two women or two men, and then but there's a man from this room and a woman from that room, there there really has to be a way to accommodate that because it is mm -hmm. a human need exactly. it, it, it just is what it is yeah. and it's yeah. also a form of expression so if these two people have now come together and formed a bond in some yeah. way and want to have that between mm -hmm. them as an expression I mean that's yeah. part of life this is their home right. and they have to be able to do that that's right it's part of our self-esteem correct our identity it's you know it's part of our qu overall quality of life absolutely you know when people talk about depression being high in the elderly population I always say you know, one of the things that we don't talk about that is contributing to depression is the fact that their sex lives are being ignored. Oh, I think that's very interesting. I never yeah, thought about that it that could be a way. big part Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. And yes, they might be grappling with illnesses that are frightening and devastating, but also their intimate life might be lacking or they are, are not able to express it the way that they want to. Or they used to. And that in itself right. can contribute uh, to their depression. Uh, absolutely. You know, but we kind of, yeah, we, we kind of. Put that under the rug. Right. <laughs> I was going to say, run to the covers or whatever. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> no, I just uh. thought of that. <laughs> and yeah. so then what about, uh, just the last thing, so there's, there's a practitioner, a trainer, and a manager. The manager, okay. So our certified dementia care manager certification. Um, that is for someone who has become a certified trainer who now manages or oversees or supervises a memory care unit. Okay. And so when they go through that training, what they get from us is a um, whole manual of policies and procedures. So if they're starting a memory care unit from the ground up, or if there's one that ha is in place that they need sprucing up, they'll have policies and procedures that they can use oh, great. to help enhance um, their um, uh, unit. As well as, you know, and little details like, you know, what's important with staffing. You know, what are the qualities you look for, you need to look for in appropriate staff to really be on the memory care unit? Because everyone can work in facilities, but then you know everybody has their special skills and talent. And right. how do you identify those and who do you put specifically on the memory care unit? So it's interesting that so you say that because I told you that I visited, um, I visited a facility, upstate New York actually, uh -huh. That had this young administrator who is a a, uh, a certified trainer, oh, okay. and he became an administrator. And he came in. I happened to know the chief operation officer of that company for many many years, and he came in and um, he he revamped their memory care. He made it into mm. an actually an, into an actual memory care unit, or he's on the road to doing that. Yeah. I mean, there were still some things that I saw that yeah. probably needed some improvement, but he definitely had made tremendous inroads. Um, so I did ask him this very question you talked about staffing. 
So um, just like, uh, like I said, I worked on a, a vent unit, people mm -hmm. who work on a vent unit, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a certified nurse's aide, whoever it is has to be trained right. in that area. Many years ago, I worked in a facility. It was the first one that I ever saw do this. They had a, um, a unit for people who had psychological and emotional issues, and they mm -hmm. trained everybody who came to that union, including the person who delivered the laundry or, Absolutely. you know, the maintenance yep. people, because mm -hmm. the, whoever interacts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so my question to this administrator was, so let me ask you this question. If you're short-staffed on a particular day, you know where I'm going with this question. Mm -hmm. If somebody calls out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or people are on vacation, do you transfer people into that unit from other areas of your facility who are not trained? Mm. Obviously, that was, that was a difficult question for him to answer. Yeah. Because that means then you'd have to train all of the staff. So, yeah. yeah. See, and what I think you were bringing home, uh, the major point to him is that just because you have a memory care unit and you train those people um, does not mean you're doing the right thing. Correct. Your entire building should be trained. Correct. Your entire building, because things like that happen. And guess what? On the units that are not considered memory care, people start having dec uh, cognitive Absol decline. Absol <laughs> absolutely. So, and your frontline staff have to, you know, right. be able to interact with that and, right. and be uh, understand you know, that and know how to sufficient with it. Right, exactly, right. and proficient. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, it it takes the whole building has to be educated. Just like you said, housekeepers, dietary, everyone right. needs the education. Well, like we said, you know, not everybody might be eligible to get certified, but everybody needs the education. Right. Yeah. You know, it's uh, so when I work with families or individuals mm -hmm. and I, you know, try to advise them and coach them about mm -hmm. the questions they should ask when they're touring to look for a building for right. their, uh, or I should, I don't want to say placement, when they, I, I've started to change my terminology because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that will help. You know, the words yeah. we use affect how we think. Awesome. So I don't say we're right. placing them or putting them, but when, when their loved one has to move to, because it's geography really, they can't live here anymore. So right. I have a whole thing about that. I won't go into yeah. that now, how it's really just geography. So they can't live here anymore. Right. They have to move into this, you know, situation. Right. And so there are questions that I tell people to ask and, you know, mm -hmm. it's about that. Uh, some of the questions have to do with right. that. Right. When somebody has dementia or, you know, is advancing in their cognitive difficulties, mm -hmm. um, you know, routine is important, familiarity is important. Mm -hmm. Now some strange person comes in they never mm -hmm. saw before. They don't know that voice. Like you say, maybe it's not even the facial recognition. Maybe it's the tone of voice that right. they know. Right. Uh, you know, we all know when we work with somebody for a while, they say, oh, I know you were walking down the hall. I could hear your footsteps. Mm -hmm. So there's right. a lot about a person that conveys information. That's right. And, you know, that person that they're used to, that's not the information they're getting, and now mm -hmm. how are they responding? Mm -hmm. And th what right. knowledge does that person have in terms of how to respond to them? Right, and that's why part of our training is that we tell them you have to document very well. Right. You know, what's the body language you use? What are the words you use? What's the body language that the patient uses? And the right. key words they use, and what what meaning is attached to those words? Yeah, but how many so people... So that someone just coming, uh, you know, say from unit A now t to work on unit B because they're short, they need to be able to read that and know, right. you know, she uses this word for bathroom. She uses, right. you know, she won't leave the room unless she has her black pocketbook on right. her lap. Right. You know, you need to, so we always say you have to document every day in detail because sometimes you're not there. Right, you so know? how are facilities, you know, and I say facilities, you know, accommodating mm -hmm. that when they're short staffed, people don't, they have these tasks, they have a certain amount of time, right. you know, you look yeah. at, uh, you and I I'm sure have looked at many progress notes and many charts, yeah. thousands and thousands, they all sound the same, the person, you yeah. know, this was their temperature, this was their this, yeah. this was their that, but no but real substantive information unless something happens, unless there's true. an incident. Yeah, right? and that's what we say, especially in memory care, the notes have to be detailed and individualized. Right. You know, we say it all the time. You know, your care plans have to be individualized. Right. And it's true. It right. Every care plan cannot look the same because everybody's not the same. Right. And so it's important that we name those specific details. You know, as I was saying before, what are her common phrases and what do they mean? Right. You know, is there a certain body language she presents and what does that mean? Right. Does you she know, only like chocolate milk? 
uh, exactly. you know, something <laughs> simple something like, like that. that. Yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. We found out um, in one facility years ago, there was a woman who um, had good appetite once she started eating, but she would always kind of resist eating. So they thought the dining room was too noisy, was it too much distraction, so they would make it quieter, put her in a quieter dining room. And you know what it was? She needed to hear grace said. <laughs> so it was just oh. a, a, a cue from right. her entire lifetime. Correct. Once grace was spoken, then she was cued that now you can start eating. Right. So, you know, these are little things that need to be detailed right. in the care plan for people so that we know, you know, what are their special needs um, to help them along to, again, add quality to their life for that day and also create moments of joy, make things easy. Now, I think that's yeah. a, you know, that's a great a great way of thinking about it and mm -hmm. for people to think mm -hmm. about it yes. because it is difficult when you're working with somebody and and then if you're in a building and there are many many people right. but uh, if you're at home with somebody um, you know to think about it that way it gives you an entirely different perspective mm -hmm. just have one more question home care agencies yeah. um, mm -hmm. are people who work for home care agencies specifically trained or are they required to be trained they are. And it depends on, now, you know, state by state regulations vary. You know, and, so, and some places it's loose. There's not a lot of regulations at all. Um, and so if someone goes to, say, a technical training school, usually it's built into the curricula to have a portion that is specifically a gerontological portion, and they do cover dementia. They might gloss over. It's different across the country. Right. They might gloss over it in some ways, or some programs might be very detailed. We're proud to say that we're, we are, our, de our dementia curriculum is actually used um, in a number of uh, home care agencies. Oh, that's great. Yeah, So and, you know, not technology schools as well. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. so that... You know, we know when they come out, they graduate with their certification and they're going to someone's home and dementia is present, we are quite confident that they're going to do well with that patient. So that's something that families, uh, a question that a family should uh, ask, they should a ask. home care uh, agency, if even mm -hmm. if their, their loved one has mild cognitive decline, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's, you know, uh, it. You know, it could be a difficult thing even when it starts to become mild. And the person is aware, they become frustrated, and then that sets up a whole other chain reaction that's and right. communication. Right. So that's a question that they should really ask. They should be you asked. know, uh, is the person that you're going to send me, or I need a person who's trained in dementia, is certified in dementia training, or whatever terminology they want to use? Yeah, they should. They absolutely should. Something just happened significant in the state of Illinois. Um, they just passed legislature that said in nursing homes, they have to, their, their staff has to be trained in dementia care, and they recommend two courses. We are one of those courses. Oh, great. Yeah. That's, Throughout that's, the state of Illinois. That's terrific. Yeah. That should be in every state, if you ask yeah. me. We actually are part of a movement that occurred in the state of Texas, uh, where the Department of Health there actually was involved with, of course, reducing psychotropic use, especially oh, that's a whole in the other elderly story. population, right. and then especially in the dementia population. Right. And what happened was the state of Texas was la listed bottom of the list as last, meaning they were doing, you know, they were prescribing the most psychotropic. Right. Poor. They were doing for poorly. Your dementia and your elderly right. population. So what they did was they had every surveyor in the state of Texas go through our training and become trainers. Oh, my goodness. And they teach our curriculum for free to any facility throughout the state of Texas that would like their staff trained. And you know what? Their numbers are rising. They're not number 50 anymore. Let's put it oh, like that. Oh, that is, I got <laughs> so it's, we have evidence-based that, yeah, that our course is evidence-based that implement, implementing our course has actually improved quality outcomes for the patient. And that's what it's about, mm -hmm. quality of life, mm -hmm. quality of mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. I mean, dignity, respect, mm -hmm. because, you know, as, as, you know, I'm sure we both say, you know, this is a human being who's lived their life. They, they, they're not doing this on purpose. Not it's all. not intentional. Yeah. This is a yeah. disease process as if they had another disease like cancer or you said, you know, whether it's diabetes, whatever it is, but they don't have control over this. They're not doing this on purpose. Right. And therefore, the treatment has to match the symptoms that they're presenting. And these symptoms are cognitive symptoms. It's, 
and it has to be start to be thought of in that way. In that way, absolutely. Yeah. Well, anyway, Lynn, this was just so terrific. I'm so glad you were able to come. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. We're on 2001 now because I'm going to be a You're coming on. You're going to be a trainer. I love it. I love it. Absolutely. And a manager. I want to become a manager Yes, become a dementia care manager. Absolutely. So anyway, thanks so much for making the trip. This was just so terrific. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you for having me today. It was really great. So thanks for tuning in today, and I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. This is Phyllis Amon saying goodbye until we see you next time on The Golden Years, Understanding Better Living. Hi, I'm Lynn Diot gordon from the International and National Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners. Thank you for watching my interview. If you'd like more information about our dementia care seminars or any of our certifications, you can go to our website at nccdp.org. That's ncc dp.org or give us a call at 973-729-6601. Thank you.